What do you say we get started then on our third character for the week? Remember, we are using Volos to give us racial stats and information. Everything else is going to come out of the player's handbook or the DMG if necessary, which whew, we came close. We already have two evil characters in the party. Yep, no problem, Torchic. When you when you can actively uh, engage in chat, um, my, ooh, pardon me, that's soda. Um, myself or uh, Dark Wolf or Ivalon can help teach you how to go on these little uh, these little chat adventures that we have. <clears throat> Alright, so we have our blank character sheet open. Um, while all of you are following visually, uh, at least Torchic is going to be following audibly. And, of course, our goal is to make sure we can present to both kinds of audiences. Uh, so, Torchic, I want you to be the brutally honest uh, Pokemon that you are. And uh, when we finish this character, uh, if you are willing, I'd like your feedback again to let us know how we did in being able to paint a picture to your mind's eye. Could you follow along the character process, or could you build this character in your noggin as we were discussing him or her? And in fact, a him or a her, let's roll a percentile die and find out. Uh, Mage asks, is it possible to be an evil character and not be a bad person? Or is that impossible? It is not impossible. I rolled a 40, which indicates that we are going to get a female character. Um... Plunder loot, or uh, if someone out there wants to address Mage, uh, Mage's question, then uh, yeah, it's over. It's over nine thousand, isn't it? Plunder loot, uh, plunder loot. I don't know if you would like to try and take a stab at Mage's question uh, about is it possible to be an evil character and not a bad person, or she asks, is that impossible? All right, we have a female character, but a female what? We're going to roll that 13-sided die and find out which of the 13 Volos uh, Guide to Monsters races we are. Hit it. Number five. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh, a Goliath. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Goliaths are kind of half giants. Maybe, maybe third giants. I have a 4th edition character who's a female Goliath. Uh, she is a rune priest, and her name is Alagrippa. I have a ton of fun role-playing her. Next up, we're going to roll 2 percentile die and find out where on the alignment chart she's going to be. Right, one one axis is evil, neutral, good. The other axis is chaotic, neutral, lawful. Roll it. 88 and 43, we have another evil character. My gosh. My gosh, my golly. That was 88 and 43, so that is going to be a neutral evil. Uh, Torchic is giving an example in Christianity. Adam and Eve eating from the tree was an evil act, but they didn't do it to be mean. Um, that uh, th that could be, yeah, th that could be an example. Um, or look at it this way. In, in role-playing mage, don't think of evil as people who want to burn down orphanages and kick puppies in the street. Like, this isn't some, you know, uh, uh, what's the proper term? Like, uh, Dickinsonian, you know, like uh, Charles Dickens, all the, you know, downtrodden urchins in the street, and, you know, everyone's, like, whipped at Christmas, and it's completely horrible, and, 
Like, it, you, we, we don't have... There are stereotypical evil people who do want to wake up. You know, uh, witches who want to, you know, bake children into bread or something like that. That does exist. But you can think of evil perhaps as more of a selfish bend. You are going to put yourself before other people. Um, I don't know, if you are... I don't, if you were the leading doctor in malaria research on the Titanic, and you're a man, and you put yourself in a lifeboat before the women and children, would that be an evil act? I mean, it's selfish, right? Though you can justify it. Look, if I die, all of my research goes, and, and thousands, millions of people will die because I can't research this disease. So my life is more important than the life of some woman or some child. Um, you know, he's not trying to be a mean person, but he is more, he has more self-interest in, in himself and what he's doing and his thoughts on what's important to the world. Now, mind you, I, I mean, the, the widow or, or the to be widow or the, the child could very well be someone important or could have had an entire life's worth of effort to not to, to save tens of millions of people or to be a global leader or something. So, but, you know, that we're getting into some unknowns in that case and some presumptions. Uh, Dwargum says being evil and being sinful are two different things. So, hopefully, Mage, um, hopefully I was able to address that. Uh, I mean, Dorgrim, if you have any sage advice you want to offer as well. Mage says, I'm trying to get a hand on understanding the differences between the different alignments, but I see where you're coming from. So yeah, instead of good and evil, think of selfless and selfish. Instead of law and chaos, think um, uh, maybe structured or, meth or uh, you, you have a methodical reasoning. You have a methodical way of doing things and an unstructured or an impulsive, methodical and impulsive, selfless and selfish. And maybe that will paint you a little clearer picture uh, than kind of the black and white divisions we get with the nine alignments. Um, neutral, yeah, you could say it's apathetic, or you'll put yourself first, but maybe not always. Um, or, you know, if, if you're a good person, you'll go way out of your way, you know, you'll volunteer in religious and civic organizations, or you, you'll sacrifice yourself uh, nearly or unquestioningly uh, for people whom you may never have met. A neutral person may look out for their family, but might not care about the neighbors. Uh, a neutral person... Uh, will pay all of their bills and then maybe give charity uh, and then maybe give to charity afterwards. But they've made sure that their their things are taken care of or whatever their interest is is satisfied before then uh, pursuing in altruistic uh, fashion or choosing to ignore people. So maybe it's not apathy per se. It might be more accurate to say it is... It's more of self-interest than selfish. Selfish, you have the, you know, everything you want to come to you and to be, you know, suited in your fashion. So, you know, the world is tilted down at you so you receive uh, the blessings and the knowledge and the money and everything from the world, right, if you're selfish. If you're self-interested then you'll take your fill, but then you're going to tilt the ramp back up. You're, you're not interested in abusing that necessarily. So in this case, we have a neutral evil female Goliath. She's going to be very much interested in her own acts, in her own actions. Maybe, you know what? She could very well be a very loyal person to her people. And support them, and she probably plays with puppies, and uh, you know has baby uh, has babysitted the neighbor's. Um, pardon me, has babysitted the neighbor's kid. Though outside of her Goliath village, she might be more cold or harsh. 
it will get to her personality in a little bit, but I want to try and link that uh, that conversation to what we're doing with our character. It it can be mage, and you hear you see a lot of memes about alignment, and you know alignment was a lot more stratified uh, stratified in prior editions. It was very emphasized. In this one, it exists. Um, it exists more formally, actually, than in 4th edition. Though it's not as structured. Or rather, it's, um, it, it's not that it's not structured. It's a singular part of your character's personality. It is not the guiding star of your character. In my opinion. Uh, good advice, Dorgrim. Alright, so neutral evil, female Goliath. Um, when we roll into our class, if she is a cleric or a paladin, then there is a bonus chance for something a little different. What level is she? We're going to go back to roll one percentile dice set. 58. That is right on the cusp of 13. Level 13. That means we are going to get a few ability score improvements, or ASIs, or as they're also known, <laughs> stat bumps. That means you get plus 2 to 1 ability, or plus 1 to 2 abilities, or if your DM allows it, you can take a feat. I am fine giving characters feats, and we're going to roll and see of the three she gets. She's going to get one at four, one at eight, and one at twelve. Um, we're going to see how many of these three end up being feats instead of stat bumps. We rolled a fifty-eight, so they're all going to be—they're uh, all going to be ASIs. Now, for her background, we're going to roll this D thirteen again and find out which background she has. A five. Ah, she is a folk hero. A folk hero to her people. There are D10 origins to being a folk hero in the player's handbook, and we're going to roll and see which kind she is. A number eight. I'm simply going to type in number eight next to her name. I don't know what eight is, and frankly, at this point, it doesn't matter. This is a placeholder. We'll explore that in a little bit. To finish her personality, I'm going to roll 2d8 and 3d6. 5 and 4 for her personality traits. 6, 6, and 2 for her ideals, bonds, and flaws, respectively. These are just placeholders. Again, I am not concerned with what they mean just yet. Now we come to the class. That is going to be a big shiny gold D12 that my hat is partially blocking. There we go. Remember, if we get Cleric or Paladin, uh, we're going to get some special options. Four. A Druid. Ah, okay. Of the Druid class... There are two different specialties. You can be Circle of the Land, which is a spellcaster, or Circle of the Moon, which is um, more of a shapeshifter druid. Odds or evens, respectively. I'm going to roll the d12 again. One, that is Circle of the Land, indicating she's going to be a, um, a more of a spellcasting focused druid. There we go. Bloody Torchic says there's also less stuff that it affects. Like there used to be uh, where there was all kinds of alignment dependent spells. Now it's mostly just detect good and evil, yep, or protect good or evil. And they're both, st and good and evil are stacked in the same spell. Really, the only effect is it has on the players is when the DM says, hey, that was, uh, that was poopy, I'm changing your alignment. Yeah, so if, if you do something, if you claim you're playing some kind of a good character, 
and then you use your lightsaber to murder all the younglings, that might earn you an alignment change, right? <laughs> um, so your alignment can change. There is a... The closest thing to what you're talking about that still exists, Bloody Torchic, in 5th edition would be a paladin losing their paladin hood because they're not upholding their vows. You could argue a cleric could do the same, but there's less of a dramatic shift as a what a paladin would see. Yeah, don't be a skywalker. Um, in older editions, uh, it, in order to be a monk, monks had the rider of any lawful character could be a monk. So that meant you had to be lawful good, lawful neutral, or lawful evil to be a monk. Uh, as it fit the personality. The 5th edition player's handbook encourages it and says monks, you're going to find monks are going to be, t uh, or are going to tend to be more lawful because of the structured life that they live inside the monastery. So they, they give a role-playing direction for you to follow, but it is not a mechanical requirement. So, Torchic, that is a very good observation. Okay, our height, weight, and age we're not really going to need off of this chart, with the exception of the distribution curve for the age of the hero. I'm going to roll a percentile die and record the results on page 2. 30, so she is going to be a young adult. Okay. We are finished with the spreadsheet portion of the generation. Now we're going to go to Matty Morg's Guide, to Volo's Guide, to Monsters, as player characters, a guide. <laughs> I, of course, I did that for a little bit of a fun and cheek flourish. Did I say fun and cheek or ton tongue and cheek? Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Now, Goliaths here, uh, they have their own height and weight chart, and I'm highlighting, and they also have a slightly longer age range than humans do. As you can see, that is modified here as well. Let's begin by producing her physical stature. Goliaths start at 6 foot 2 inches, and we are going to add 2d10 inches to that height. Load up 2d10, hit roll. We're adding 16 inches, meaning that she is going to be 7 foot 6 inches tall. We're going to take this same 16 that we just generated and multiply it by the weight modifier of 2d6. 9. We're going to add that total to her base weight of 200 pounds. Uh, so let's see. So we have 6 times 9. That's 4. Uh, carry the 5. That's going to be uh, 145 pounds. So she is 345 pounds. And is 7.5 feet tall. By being a young adult, she's between ages 19 and 30 years old. So I'm going to roll a d12. 3. 19, 20. She's 21 years old. There we go. Bloody Torchek ripped. Yeah. Yeah. She is, uh, she is, uh, she's a healthy girl, that's for sure. Uh, she drinks her milk, she takes her vitamins, she says her prayers, um, or does whatever she's doing to, uh, to appease nature, uh, because she is probably quite bounteous. All right, we are finished now with the random number generation. It's time to begin telling her story and putting in the crunchy bits. 
Uh, we are going to talk about fluff, personality, storytelling. The crunchy bits are math. So, away with you, guide. I don't need you anymore. Now, I have opened the player's handbook to chapter four, which is personality and background. I like starting here because this is what your character did before they were an adventurer. It also helps us to define who she is. What does she do? How does she think? What is her methodology? And by approaching it this way, I find it makes for a little, a little easier storytelling for your character. And, uh, and by the way, uh, Mage, in Chapter 4 here, this does... Uh, th there is a blurb about the different alignments that exist. Um, so, for example, for Neutral Evil, uh, this is the alignment of those who do whatever they can get away with without compassion or qualms. Many Drow, some Cloud Giants, and Yugoloths are Neutral Evil. Um, so, is this a big philosophical stance on alignment? as a fluff or a crunch bit to your character? No, but it is a, a quick blurb to give you a, a reference. Howdy Lips, it's good to see you again. How's it going? Would you be willing to dance to uh, Smooth Criminal by Michael Jackson for a sub? Um, I don't know. I, I, I can dance a little bit. My uh, we, we get our vampire character to... Uh, we, we get our vampire character to dance... I don't have those shoes, though, that Michael Jackson himself patented in order to be able to get that lean, you know? Um, so I, I don't think I could faithfully uh, reproduce the dance, Pouty Lips. But if I can, if uh, you are willing or entertaining the idea of subbing, uh, I will do my best to continue to earn that by providing you uh, fun, recreation, knowledge, and a community of fellow tabletop role players and board gamers and, and such. Yep, Mage. Uh, he actually patented, uh, like Michael Jackson himself created and patented shoes just to be able to do that effect. The more you know. We're going to now scroll through the backgrounds. They are listed alphabetically. I will. There's entertainer. Here's folk hero. Let's peer into the looking glass and find out more about our Goliath. Skill proficiencies: animal handling. So all of those, uh, all the moo cows and the bog goats you're hearing in the background, she's uh, helping herd those. Must be a farmer's girl. Kind of grew up on the farm in the countryside here. And survival. She's going to be proficient in some kind of artisan's tools. And land vehicles. So she can drive a wagon and she's good at doing something. Does she make shoes? Does she make barrels? Does she make wheels? Um, weapons? Does she brew? Uh, is she an alchemist? We can give her proficiency with some kind of a, a professional set of tools. Mage says, I like the Moonwalk more, though I'm a, I'm a bit rusty with it. You know, I like the Moonwalker uh, game. I played it on Sega Genesis way back in the day. So, Pouty Lips, hopefully, that, uh, hopefully I didn't let you down too much there. But in its place, you got some random trivia and even some nostalgia if you if you also played that video game. Dark Wolf, uh, the Tin Man and Wizard of Oz had similar shoes. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's also going to get a little bit of equipment here. She will get a set of that Artisan's Tools. Now, if this was my character, Allegrippa, my uh, my fourth edition uh, Goliath character, uh, she carries around, uh, well, she did anyway, a sack full of things from her home village in the mountains. So she had some goat pelts and horns. Uh, she had uh, samples of goat milk and yak milk and uh, probably some llama spittle. <laughs> Just, I was thinking of all kinds of different fun things that she could bring down 
uh, to try and entice trade to go back to her home village. Hey, I always wondered if they use magnets or something to keep their feet like that. Never considered it was in the shoes. Yeah, uh, if you look it up on, just do a little bit of Google Foo now that you have an expanded frame of reference. And I think you can even see the, the patent uh, that he made for him. Alright, so we get our artisan's tools and whatever she does for a living. Uh, a shovel. Oh, she could be a shovel knight. An iron pot. Common clothes. And a belt pouch with 10 gold in it. Her defining event, we rolled randomly as number 8. Now we're going to take a placeholder and we're going to apply story to it. Her, def her uh, defining event, number 8. A lord rescinded an unpopular decree... After I led a symbolic act of uh, of protest against it. Ah. So she uh, she rebelled uh, in protest against some local governor, perhaps. And, um, I don't know, maybe... Maybe Goliaths uh, were apportioned the same ration as other people, even though they're taller and do more work. And she said, no, come on, we're bigger, we deserve more, and you also work us more. Um, if you don't want to give us as much food as, uh, as like, a human, then make us only do a portion of our work. Or, you know, just th think of something thematic. In a home game that you're running this character, and talk to your DM. What is a Goliath? Where do I live? Uh, what are some cultural aspects? And propose those to your DM also. Come up with a story and say, does this work in your world? And if not, you can negotiate back and forth. You're liking her more and more, mage. The feature she gets is rustic hospitality. Since you come from the ranks of the common folk, you fit in among them with ease. You can find a place to hide rest, or recuperate among other commoners unless you have shown yourself to be a danger to them. They will shield you from the law or anyone else searching for you, though they will not risk their lives for you. So she rose up. Uh, yeah, she's already, a, uh, she's already a, a tall drink of water here. She rose up among her people, led this rebellion that rescinded uh, some kind of an unpopular decree, and the people are willing to protect her because of that. That's what that background is. Now for her personality. So if you're liking her more and more, well then buckle up, mage. We still have five aspects to her personality to explore. Number five. I'm confident in my own abilities and do what I can to instill confidence in others. And number four, I have a strong sense of fair play and always try to find the most equitable solution to arguments. Now you may, we're looking at this and you're like, well, but she's neutral evil. How does that work? Don't worry. We'll, we'll get there. Remember, alignment is a part of her personality and we're telling a story. Bubonic, hey, uh, what are we making tonight? A female Goliath Circle of the Land Druid, level 13. And we're just getting to her personality. By the way, she, it, it, she's, a, she's, a, she's a big girl. She drank her milk. She probably eats, like, fresh beef off the farm. And, um, you know, grits and country gravy. Her ideal is number six. Thinking is for other people. I prefer action. Bonds. Also number six and on the next page. 
destiny. Nothing and no one can steer whoop, me away from my higher calling. So she is destined for something, or so she feels. And her flaw, which is number two, because we are all flawed creatures. I worked the land. I love the land. Oh, wait, hang on. Was that... That was ideal? Bond? Wait, what's her flaw? Did I get... Did I choose something wrong? Destiny was, was her ideal. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I was on the wrong page. Her ideal isn't thinking for other people. Her ideal is destiny. Sorry about that. I, I got confused. So, control X and control V. There we go. All right, it was 662. So her bond is number six. I wish my childhood sweetheart had come with me to pursue my destiny. Oh, She wants to fight beside her, uh, her significant other. And now for her flaw, which is number two, I'm convinced of the significance of my destiny and blind to my shortcomings and the risk of failure. All right, so look, we have destiny brought up in three different ways. This is, uh, she feels that she is above and beyond um, and that she can, she's going out into the world in order to do more than just get a local governor to rescind an unpopular law. Bubonic one says, I'm messing around with Kotab tonight already through part two and most of the side dungeons. Uh, what, uh, what was that as an abbreviation for, Bubonic one, Kotab? Oh no, and Chemison, Chemison succumbed to the wandering monster. All right, there we go. So we've, we've built her up. Now, I'll go through her personality one more time in full because I did make a mistake and I forgot to switch pages earlier. She's confident in her own abilities and uh, do what she can to instill confidence, or and does what she can to instill confidence in others. She has a strong sense of fair play and always tries to find the most equitable solution to arguments. Her ideal is destiny. Nothing and no one can steer me away from, uh, well, can steer her away from her higher calling. Her bond? I wish my childhood sweetheart had come with me to pursue my destiny. And a flaw? I'm convinced of the significance of my destiny and blind to my shortcomings and the risk of failure. The Curse of the Azure Bonds. Gotta love gold box games. At least the last three Forgotten Realms ones and the Kryn ones. Oh, oh, so yeah, th these are... You were talking about that earlier, the older edition, uh, almost like the MUD games, M-U-D-D, -D, from... Uh, um, oh, early days of gaming. And D&D &D as well. All right, that is her background. She got some skills. She got a personality out of it. We learned a lot about her as a character as well. Now it is time to discover what being a Goliath does for her. We're going to open our Volo's Guide to Everything, and we are going to go to the Goliath page. Page 108. As you can see... They are, um, they're given a big cultural blurb. 
I would suggest reading this. It's a good primer into the theme of the Goliath and what the developers were going for. Can your Goliaths be different in your world? Very much so. So I'm not going to worry too much about the... Um, I'm not going to worry too much about the, the fluff that they've automatically included. I'm only going to worry about the stats because the Goliath as a people can be one way, but she is an individual and we're developing her as an individual. Dorgrim, I might stream Champions of Kryn tomorrow. Bubonic says, look like the evil this week. Hope we don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly the, the one good person in the uh, party, uh, that'll be, that'll be fun, won't it? Okay, here's our Goliath traits. I'm going to zoom in a little bit if you're having trouble seeing because, heck, I, even I might be. I'm going to scroll up a bit. It's in the upper left corner. I've highlighted it in blue. Ability score increase. Your strength score increases by 2 and your constitution increases by 1. We already have our age and our alignment. We have our size. Our speed... Our basic speed is 30 feet, giving us a 15 climb and a 15 swim, and, well, a zero fly. Natural athlete, you have proficiency in the athletic skill. Right up here. Bink. We're going to fill in that little dot to show that we're going to add our, um, our proficiency bonus to that skills modifier. Stone's Endurance. You can focus yourself to occasionally shrug off injury. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to roll a d12. Add your constitution modifier to the number rolled and reduce the damage by that total. After you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So I'm going to type in Stone's Endurance. I'm not going to repeat all of that if you're making a character like this at home. I'm presuming by the time that you get this, uh, or that you know that, that that you'd be making this character, you would understand. Oh, I really like this, and I want it to be a part. You can write it out at home, but for purposes of what we're doing here tonight, I'm going to keep the header up. And if you have a particular question on something, you can always ask. Powerful build. You count as one size larger when determining your carrying capacity and the weight. You can push, pull, or drag. In many instances, encumbrance doesn't necessarily come into play. But there is an equation to figure out how much you can push, pull, or drag. Mm, pardon me. Mountainborn. You're acclimated to high altitude, including elevations above 20,000 feet. You're also naturally adapted to cold climates, as described in Chapter 5 in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Well, well, well. Looks like we're going to have to crack open our DMGs and go to Chapter 5. Uh, dungeon features mapping a dungeon. Doors. Secret doors. Ooh, secret. Concealed doors. Uh, wilderness. Here we go. Extreme cold. Whenever the temperature is at or below zero degrees Fahrenheit, a creature exposed to the cold must succeed on a DC 10 con saving throw at the end of each hour or gain one level of exhaustion. Creatures with resistance or immunity to cold damage are automatically or automatically succeed on the saving throw, as do creatures wearing cold weather gear and creatures naturally adapt to cold climates. So I believe that's what they're, they're getting at here. You're also naturally adapted to cold climates in that instance, then we don't have to worry about the conditions of extreme cold. So we will not get exhausted. And for our languages, common and giant. 
Plunder Loot says, today's a sad day. Curse of Strahd died. Um, do you want... Uh, well, is that something you want to talk about? Or is that... Is that a side conversation? Alright, so that is what she gets by being a Goliath. And if you want to see... I'll zoom in a little bit more. Here is an example portrait of a Goliath. I mean, almost, if you just add a, a beard, this is almost like Kratos from uh, the new God of War. I know for really any of them, but from God of War 4. Torchic asks a question. Do you ever post any of these uh, Word docs? Uh, yes, uh, Torchic. Um, I can't really see what program he's using, but the characters or any of that stuff that he writes on screen. Um, yeah, so Torchic, if you want character sheets, um, there are commands that you can use to go to the links for them. And if there's something in particular uh, that you're looking for, uh, for instance, I worked with Bubonic One to get the random character generator up and going. If you want to talk to Bubonic One, you can, or you can send me a message, and we can talk and see what you're looking for. All right, so Goliaths don't have um, don't have any sub races. If you wanted to, while they're not necessarily half giants per se, uh, if you want to do what we do for things like half elves or even tieflings and go odds or evens, they favor their giant cultural heritage or their humanoid or whatever their, their human cultural heritage, you could do that. Or, I don't know, if you want to distinguish them, if these are people of the stone in the mountains, um, maybe you have... Uh, maybe you've developed something like uh, there are different ethnicities of Goliaths in your world. So you get ones from mountains like the Appalachians. And so maybe they actually have a greenish hue because, you know, those are old mountains, very broken down, still very beautiful, but uh, they're covered with ferns and trees and brush. Meanwhile, you go out to the Rockies. I, I'm using I'm using U.S. geography because I know that the best. Uh, if you're in Europe or uh, some other location, then you can fill it in yourself. But if you go to the Rockies, maybe that's more of a brownish or reddish brownish complexion uh, to mimic those mountains. So maybe maybe the where they live has some sort of like a chameleon effect on uh, on their on how they look. Functionally, they're the same. Um, if you I, I don't know, you get some Goliaths living on the Hawaiian Islands. And they're going to have a darker complexion because of all of the igneous rock that exists, and especially currently, right? Um, and then if you have, like, big, cold, gray, you know, granite slate mountains, uh, you know, like a, a whitish gray, maybe that's the type that you see in the portrait here, and that reflects in their skin color. Or any such birthmarks or modeling or freckles or things like that. So you could almost tell where a Goliath comes from by how they present themselves. Oh, um, so Bloody Torchic, uh, I will, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, Torchic, when you are free... And when, when I'm free on Discord, I will, I'll hook you up with some resources. Okay, Torchic? Just let me know. Uh, Plunderloot says, let's just say we were supposed to try and talk about the issues with what the players were doing and two did not show up to discuss how to fix the issues and salvage it. I felt sad that it happened in this way because it was a highlight of my week. But... Um, but I feel it's better because, yeah, no uh, bad game. Um, bad game is uh, is worse than no game. That that is true, and you know what? I've had to call sessions early myself. 
Um, and campaigns, kind of, we took, we took quite a break at one point. Um, but you know what, Plunder Loot, there will be more games, there will be other games. This could even free you up to work on your other projects, like your Call of Cthulhu project, or if you want to get, or not, it wasn't Call of Cthulhu. It was, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, that kind of a thing. Okay, we have background. We have race. Now we need to add in her class features. Go to D for Druid. She is level 13. So everything in the blue box is what we're going to consider. But don't let your eyes cross. It's This will be fine. This will be easy. Generating a level 1 character and a level 19 character take almost the exact same amount of time. Well, for the basic character. If we get into, like, choosing spells, if they're spellcasters, that, but, I mean, if to just put the slots in the considerations. Bloody Torch check, Wi-Fi here sucks. I got booted right after I sent my last message. Oh, okay. Um, so, Torch check... Let me know when you're free on Discord, and I can I can help get this info to you and take you to, uh, like, I can guide you to some places to get that content you're looking for. Okay, druids are D8 hit dice casters. They're not the, the fragile D6 of wizards. And because she is level 13, conven uh, conveniently, she has 13 D8 hit dice. We are going to get proficiency with light armor, medium armor, and shields. As for weapons, druids get a very interesting array of weapons. I'm just going to write in druid weapons. Dark Wolf. <laughs> so Dark Wolf just sort of flops on her desk. And exact. <laughs> Mm, pardon, hiccup. And exasperatedly uh, says, recap posted. So there are certain weapons that they use. We'll, I'm putting in uh, druid weapons there. Um, tools, we are skilled with the herbalism kit. Our saving throws are intelligence and wisdom. I'm going to fill in the diamonds here. That indicate saving throw instead of the circle for skill. And now we need to determine her skills, and I will go through her personality one more time uh, in order to... Um, oh, you want to come up and say hi to people? Yeah, there you go. And um, I'll go over her personality so we can best determine which two skills she would take. I'm sure she already has animal handling. So we got to choose two from Arcana, Insight, Medicine, Nature, Perception, and Religion. This is her personality. I'm confident in my own abilities and do what I can to instill confidence in others. I have a strong sense of fair play and always try to find the most equitable solution to my arguments. Destiny. Nothing and no one can steer me away from my higher calling. That is her ideal. Her bond is, I wish my childhood sweetheart had come with me to pursue my destiny. And her flaw is, I'm convinced of the significance of my destiny and blind to my shortcomings and the risk of failure. Uh, Mage Arcana would be the knowledge of magic and spells... You know, maybe certain artifacts, um, things along those lines. Tycho says, BRB, running a dungeon. Uh, 
Bubonic one is saying religion and nature. I think I, I am with you for sure on religion, Bubonic. Uh, I, if she has this overwhelming sense of destiny, she probably got her hands on some different books and has been reading up on folk tales or mythologies or things like that, and that has instilled this sense of greatness. And I'm not against nature either. Oh, Mage is uh, saying uh, nature and religion. Okay, so it, it seems like the three of us here are thinking nature and religion for her. And remember, nature is the scientific understanding of nature. So you, you know things by, by proper names. You can identify, you know, should I, if you go out in the wilds because you're camping, should I wipe with this three-pointed leaf? Um... You know, that's different than survival, because survival is where can I go to find f edible food in potable water. So yeah, I would agree. Religion and nature, I think, are going to make sense for her. If only you could hear her purr. My gosh. She's like a little squeeze box of purrs. I love it. Yeah, Bubonic, you don't want to you don't want to wipe with the three pointed leaf. All right, now we can give her some equipment as a part of her, uh, as a part of her package here of being a druid, a wooden shield or any simple weapon, a scimitar and any simple melee weapon, leather armor, an explorer's pack, and a druidic focus. This is where we can start considering what would her stat spread be. Do we want her to be? Uh, do we want her to be a strength druid? A dex druid? Obviously wisdom, that's what we're going to be casting off of. And you know what? I think she's going to be a smart cookie as well. Or do we or do, do we just give her like a scimitar? Do we, do we give her a scimitar and a shield? Maybe she's not the best with it, but she knows how to hold it and use it somewhat. But really, she's like con, int, whiz, and then maybe um, strength, dex, charisma. Right, I don't think she's a very charismatic person, right? She's very self-absorbed. Um, she is confident in her own abilities. She has this great destiny. So I almost see charisma as being the dump stat for her. So I might argue something like 15 wisdom. Um... 14 int, 13 con, 12 strength, 10 dex, and 8 charisma. If we're going to be distributing the, uh, if we're going to be distributing the standard array into her stats. So if Dark Wolf is out there, Bubonic one, uh, Plunder Loot, if, uh, if any of you... Uh, if any of you have any input on that, oh, Bubonic likes that? Okay. So we'll keep that for right now. Uh, I'm not going to commit it just yet because we can have more discussion. Also, the page isn't ready for numbers quite yet. Now, we are also going to be able to speak the secret language of Druidic. Not worrying about spell casting, forget it exists right now. We are all going to then receive Wild Shape. And we can Wild Shape twice a day. So actually down here in this modified character sheet, I'm going to put Wild Shape and we can get it twice and we've used it zero times. There is a whole section on what happens when you Wild Shape. I suggest you read it. If you have any particular questions about it, you can let me know.
Yeah, Dex and Charisma are interchangeable. The, the, this is considering her in her natural state. Oh, it looks like uh, Death Count is having a change of heart. We have chosen our Druid Circle. And we're not high enough yet to get Timeless Body from being a generic Druid. Now, we are going to look at our Druid Circles, and especially Circle of the Land. That is the one in which we rolled her. We are going to get a bonus cantrip. I'm going to indicate we're learning this by Circle of the Land. Whoops, wrong place. Control X and Control V. Because on top of that, we are going to get at level 13. Looks like we're going to get four cantrips known. One, a two, a three. A three. Natural recovery, so we can cast more spells, and we're going to get this as part of our archetype, not by being a druid. And we are going to choose circle spells of a, a certain terrain. This is going to reflect where she learned her druidic powers. Think of it a bit like a cleric domain. Now, it may be obvious, oh, well, she lives in the mountains, so we should give her mountain. That could be, but that takes a little bit of the fun and challenge and storytelling opportunity. We can roll mountain on a D8, but what if we roll underdark or swamp? Well, she's had to travel. She's learned. Who is her mentor? Um, if we just go with what seems obvious, I think we're leaving a lot of storytelling ability on the cutting room floor. Delcorn is trying out the, the new dice to no effect. D8. Where's Where did she learn her powers? Two. Along the coast. So she's going to get more water-based spells for free. In terms of spells that she knows every day. She is also going to receive Land Stride. And at this level, she's learned Nature's uh, Sanctuary. No, not Sanctuary. Not yet. Nature's Ward. You can't be charmed or frightened by Elementals or Fey, and you're immune to poison and disease. Isn't that nice? Nice, Delcorin defeats the dreaded tree and pear. Let's put C-O-L here to indicate that is our bonus cantrip. One... Two, three, and four. I'm going to put coast, and this is going to indicate where we get these bonus uh, spells known or prepared. Third level, fifth level. Seventh level, ninth level. Actually, hold person and spike growth, I think, are second level spells. Yeah, spike growth is a second level spell. Okay, so that means. We're simply going to take these and move them over here. Nice and easy. Third, 
third, fifth, seventh, and ninth. There we go. If you want, you could put things like level three, level five, kind of like what we do for bard or wizard. It's up to you, as long as you're understanding where you're getting the spells from. At level 13, we have, let's see, four first level slots, three, 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 two, one, and one. There we go. We cast off of Wisdom. We'll fill that in. This is Druid's Circle of the Land. Spells prepared. That's in, this is going to now depend on our stats. So, every, oh, bye, so... <laughs> thank you for sharing your tail in my nose. This is now where our stats are going to be important. Because they're going to fill in the rest of our sheet. And bada bing, bada bang, bada boom, we have a druid. Uh, true neutral, nothing. Dark Wolf is correct. Our proficiency bonus at this level is five. There we go. If we add in our racial bonus, that's going to give us a strength of 14. And a con of 14. And we're going to get three different stat bumps. Fourth, eighth, and twelfth level. I can see her raising her wisdom with at least one. I can see her... what else? If we wanted to max her wisdom, we can, because the second one would be 19. And then uh, the third one, instead of going two and one, we'd go one and two. I kind of like her being a smarty also. 14 is good. Khan, she's, she's a tough girl. If we did increase her wisdom all the way, that would go to 19 with the second stat bump. And then we could have, we could save one more for something else. Let's put it in constitution. There we go. Have a little fun. Yes, cantrips are all day every day. And, um, yep, Chemisen, if you have questions, um, I'll, I will get to them as well, but it looks like uh, there's a lot of uh, ready help in the chat, too. Do not be afraid to ask questions. With these scores, now let's generate our modifiers, our ability modifiers. Two, zero, three, two, four, and minus one. Now that we have these, well, charisma is easy. We're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna copy and paste that minus one. Now wisdom, we have a four modifier, and that we have proficiencies, meaning we're gonna get to add this plus five wherever we see the circle filled in. That's gonna give us a wisdom saving throw of nine. Same with animal handling skill and survival skill. These others are going to be four. Two plus five is seven, 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 two, two, and two. We're just going to carry zero all the way through. Two for the saving throw, but seven for athletics. Because we are proficient.
This is going to give her a passive perception of 14 because it's 10 plus her perception mod, which indicates her active awareness around her at all times. We get zero dark vision. Our initiative bonus is based on our dexterity bonus, so zero. Armor class, we were given leather armor. And that is 11. That is 11 plus your dex mod, which is going to be zero. However, we can add a shield bonus of two, giving us a 13. Meaning that uh, we took the scimitar and shield. I'm going to indicate we have a shield by filling it in with that click. What else can we fill in? Hit points. Oh, got to turn in early tonight. Wish I could stay longer. No problem, Mage. Thank you for coming by, and uh, we'll help you out in Pokemon Go also. Let us know if you have any other questions in Discord um, later on when you're up. Yes, Bubonic One is correct. Your, your cantrips will scale with your level to still be useful. Current hit points. At level 1, you get your maximum hit die, which is an 8 for a Druid. Every other level, so in this case meaning 12, she's 13th level, we already did one level at 8, this is going to be plus, whoop, 8 plus 12 times half plus 1 is what I recommend going for your hit point advancement. Half of 8 is 4, plus 1 is 5. It's the slow, steady increase of hit points, though your DM might have you roll every, every level. Plus, every single level you have a uh, your con modifier and bonus hit points. So where before that was 12 times 5, because it was every level except the first, this is going to be 13 times 3 to include all 13 levels. So, yep, as Bubonic1 was saying, 12 times 5 is 60, plus 8 is 68. Plus 39. So, we, yep, we're going to get 107. She is a big druid. You want to stand, uh, you want to stand around her in combat unless you don't. <laughs> she has earned a name now. She is no longer a set of stats. Her scimitar, uh, that is, we can use it off of decks because it's finesse. We will choose not to because she is a strength-based character. This is going to be 2 plus her proficiency since she is proficient with scimitars. For a plus 7 to hit with it. And scimitars deal d6 slashing, I want to say. Let's check it out real quick. Yes, 1d6 slashing. 1d6 plus 2 slashing. Because you do get your strength modifier to that. Very good. Okay. Go back to Druid. We can fill in our spell slots on the first page. This was 4, 3, 3, 3. 2, 1, and 1. And if you have blanks here, you can leave them blank. You can X them out, put not applicable. Whatever you'd like. We can also figure out our spell attack bonus. We figured out our scimitar attack bonus, but we're not casting our spells with our muscles. Uh, we're attacking with our wisdom. That's going to be 4 plus proficiency. So we are going to roll to hit with our spells at a plus 9. To figure out the save DC of a spell you add 8 to the attack modifier. So, 17. And we'll 
fill in wild shape up here. Two and zero as reminders. Now, for a druid, you can prepare a number of spells every day after you wake up and pray or meditate for them equal to your druid level plus your wisdom modifier. We're level 13 druid, and we have a plus four wisdom. We can prepare 17 spells. You can prepare spells in any slot that you can currently cast. So we can't cast 8th level or 9th level magic, forget about it. But anything you want to wake up and, and pray or meditate for can become available to you in these other slots. That is going to be up to you as the player to pay attention to the story, and especially about what you're doing next, so that you can take the proper spells for what you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in our coastal spells, and then I think we have a character. Mirror image and misty step. Water breathing and water walk. Control weather and freedom of movement. And lastly, we'll be blessed with Conjure Elemental and Scrying. Ooh, interesting. All right, there's our character. This one doesn't necessarily have a companion, but maybe she has a favorite form she turns into. And we could make an entire companion sheet that is a quick and easy access to her favorite form. Or we could print off multiples and, and go about things that way. Yes, we do need to, uh, to pick out cantrips and such. Um, I don't want to do that immediately. I'm going to have to get up and take a break here. Plus this hat's... Ooh, it's trapping in heat. i got to take this off. Um, so I'm going to get up and take about a 10 minute break to walk around, get the blood pumping, and uh, we are going to then go into map making for the campaign that we're going to present on Saturday. Yeah, maybe a grizzly bear bubonic. I mean, what would, you know, she lives in the mountains. She turns into something. Something that lives in the mountains. Oh, she needs a name too. So you all can think on that. Anyway, I'm going to take my rest. I'll be back in a little bit. 